the recording. Uh, we still have a lot of slides to do, so let's just continue with the slideshow and hoping that you learn a little bit more about R. So one of the things that I like about R is that help is available. Um, if you don't know what you want to do, um, well, if you know what you want to do and you want to just see the help file for a certain function, like um, for example, I want to see the help file of the um, standard deviation function, which is the SD function, uh, you can just do question mark SD. If you want to search for something, um, you can do question mark question mark and then the term that you want to search for. So if you want to know like um, something about proteins, right? The normal lecture five is about proteins and you want to know are there any functions in R which deal with proteins, you can do question mark question mark proteins. Um, and then it will show you all of the help files um, that have the word protein somewhere in them. Um, so as an example, you can do question mark sec and open the help file for the sequence function. Um, and you can even ask for the help file of the uh, add function, so the plus function. Um, but the plus function you have to use quotes because of course question mark plus, um, it doesn't understand that so you have to add the double quotes. Um, and you can also search for things like obesity or um, other things. So there's a lot of help in R. Um, the help files are a little bit archaic um, if you see them for the first time. Um, but the thing is you should scroll all the way down and then there's an example. Every help file in R is required to have an example at the bottom. Um, so scrolling all the way down it shows you just a little bit of an example on how to use this function. Um, and you can copy paste the example into R um, and see what it does exactly. So. All right, so let's talk about the types of data in R. So in R, um, we have logical values. So logical values are the Boolean values either being true or false. Um, there is no other logical value. Well, NA, in theory, not uh, missing, could be a logical value as well. But uh, logical values in R are defined as being true or false. We have numeric values, which are, for example, 5 or 7.9 or 100.6. Um, R doesn't make a distinction between an integer, so a whole number, and a floating point number, like 7.9. Um, in R, everything is, is called a numeric. Um, so numeric values are everything which are a number. So, for example, infinite is a numerical value. Um, both in the sense of infinite as an integer, as infinite as a floating point. Characters are um, also available. Those are called strings in different languages. So if you're doing Java, then it's called a string. Um, and in C, it's a char pointer. Um, so a char with a star there. Um, but in R, it's called a character, and the character is, for example, one, two, three. Um, when you place it between code, uh, quotes, it automatically becomes a character. In R, we have a vector type. So a vector type is something which is multiple things in kind of a little list. So it's uh, in mathematics, this would be an array. In many other languages, it's also an array or a list. Um, but in R, it's called a vector. Um, because R is a mathematical language, it tries to stay close to the mathematical names. So um, vectors come in three different types. So a vector can contain numerical values, it can contain character values, or it can contain logical values. And it will always refer to the highest one. So if I, for example, put the one into this vector, then this will be a character vector. Because of course the, the character string one cannot be represented by a numerical value so all of the other numerical values within the vector will become character values and this is why the R type system is so difficult because it will always go to more or less the, the, the type which can contain everything so the order is logical is the lowest type numeric is the middle type and character is then the highest type so if you put a numeric value into a logical vector, the logical values will be turned into a numerical value. And because the, the numerical value has precedence above the logical values. And of course you can make matrices. So matrices are two-dimensional arrays, uh, more or less like an Excel table. Um, 
the restriction in R is that a matrix is again bound to be any of these three types. So a matrix can only contain numeric values, it can contain character values, or it can contain logical values. So you can't have a matrix which, for example, has a column with uh, character values and then in the next column uh, numerical values. Then that whole matrix will be turned into a character matrix because of the fact that character is you can re represent numeric values using characters but you can't represent characters using numerical values um, so a little bit more difficult so when you're dealing with types um, it's it's often useful so especially if you're dealing with vectors um, then something is uh, which is very um, which you can use a lot is uh, the length um, so length will um, give you the length of the vector right so if we have a vector like v1 here which contains one two three four five six elements then the length of v1 so if i ask for the length of variable v1 it will tell you that six SDR will show you the structure of an object, which is really useful if you have a list and in inside of these lists there are different things. Um, so SDR can help you figure out what the structure is of an object when it is a multi-level multi list. Uh, we will get to lists. Um, the class will tell you which class or type an object has, so in this case numeric, logical or character. And names um, allow you to set names on a vector. Um, but it will also allow you to get the names. So you can assign into the names function using the arrow um, to set the names of, an, of, a, of a vector. Um, you can force things to be of a certain type by using as and then for example as.logical or as.numeric to force things to become numeric. Of course when you force things um, there is a chance that stuff will become NAN, so not a number, or that it will become NA for missing. You can ask if something is of a certain type, so there are three functions, is logical, is numeric, and is character, um, that allow you to test if a certain object contains numeric values, character values, or logical values. So when you want to create a vector or a matrix, you can do this by, by well, a vector you can create in, in three ways. So you can use the C function to create a vector, which just says, um, which we used before, like C1, 2, 5.36 minus 2 and 4 so this will C stands for combine these will combine these loose elements into one vector um, besides that you can also use sec um, sec is of course very handy when you want to create sequences of numerical values or sequences of characters um, so you say from to and by so you can for example make a sequence from 1 to 100 by five, this means that it will step five every time. So then you get a, a you get a vector which contains one, six, eleven, sixteen, twenty-one, and so forth. So uh, this will this will just skip numbers in the middle. Um, you can also make a vector by using the rep function. So the rep function just repeats the object that you put in there an x amount of times. So that's the second parameter is times. So how many times do you want to have it repeated? Um, for matrix, we can make a matrix by using the matrix function. So you say matrix, then you give it a vector of numbers which you want to put into the matrix. And then you tell it, I want to have so many rows and so many columns. Of course, the vector has to contain number of rows times number of column of elements, right? So like I did here when I made my matrix, I make five rows, four columns, and I put the numbers 1 to 20 in there. And of course 1 to 20, the length of 1 to 20 is 5 times 4. The double point here is um, is a little bit cheaty. Well, it's one of these operators in R, and this also allows you to define a vector. Right, one double point twenty means one to twenty. So it's just the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, up until twenty. Um, and the double point is kind of the sequence function when the by is one. So the double point operator is a sequence from two, and then the by is always one. Um, you can C bind. If you want to create a matrix, imagine that I have two vectors which both have a length of 5, um, then I can say C bind vector 1, vector 2, and then I will get a matrix which has two columns each uh, and, and five rows. I can use R bind, 
which will bind stuff together in a row-wise fashion. So you can see bind that that just means you you add new columns to an already existing matrix, or you make a new matrix based on vectors by using the columns, so binding them column-wise. And R bind just does the same thing, but this does it on a row-by-row -row basis. So if I have two vectors each containing five objects, then R bind will give me two rows and five columns, while C bind will give me two columns with five rows. I hope that's clear. All right, um, like I said, there's this, this additional one to create vectors, so I can make something called V1 um, containing the numbers 1 to 4. Um, I can make V2, which is a sequence from 1 to 100 um, by 7. Um, I can make, for example, V3 by repeating the number 1 four times. Yeah, so this is how it looks like. And then I can make V2, which repeats the number A four times. So this makes a character vector, a numeric vector, a numeric vector, and another numeric vector. The matrix is more or less the same thing, so I can do Y1 um, is a matrix of 1 to 20, um, number of rows is 5, the number of columns is 4. Here I'm doing something which is, which um, I changed the slide, so I'm sorry that I changed the slide, because um, here I'm binding V1, V2, but that should actually be V1, V3. Um, so I didn't, because I, I added this example of the sequence function to it, and then I forgot to update the number here. Um, so hey, here I'm making a matrix, which is a matrix which has four rows, because V1 has four elements, V3 has four elements. Um, so hey, I can do this, and I can do Y3, which is a row bind, so this will create a 4 by 2 matrix, and the row bind here will create a 2 by 4 matrix. And of course, if I want to have more control, I can just use the matrix function and then specify how many rows and how many columns I want. All right, so um, if you then type the name of the vector, right? So if I have a vector and I type the name of the vector, um, then um, shown in R, it will show you when you type a vector, it will show you like this. So it will do this square bracket with one inside and then it will show you the first elements of the vector and then of course it will continue on the next row um, but then it will have a square bracket with the next index so the first index in this vector is a value which is missing na when you have a matrix and you type matrix or and you type the name of the matrix or the, the name of the variable containing the matrix then r will print it like this so it will put the rows here and it will put the columns here and you see that it uses comma one and that means this is the whole column one it will use one comma and then this is the whole row so this goes to by the indexes so there's indexes here um, on the vector there's indexes on the matrix if you want to index stuff from a vector then we can use um, the, the, the square brackets like we already saw so if this is my vector called phi containing a b c d e f g and i then if i want to get the fifth element out i do v5 and then i get the e out because this is the one two three four fifth element if i want to get the second to the fifth element out so if i want to make a subset of the vector v then i can do two two five right and it will get two to five out if i want to have a sequence which um if i want to get like parts of the vector out which are not attached to each other then i can use the c function to make a new vector so you can use a vector a numeric vector to index another vector um, which i'm doing here so i'm making a vector which is two to five so two three four and five and then i'm adding eight to that vector and then using that to select from v I hope that's clear like this is generally where things become a little bit iffy and people start like oh but this is it's not difficult but it's like if you want to figure this out by yourself then it's 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 difficult like the indexing in, in vectors is already hard um, but this will of course get the same as before so element two to five but it will also get the h element so you get a, a vector back which has a length of five which contains b c d e and h so it's just creating a vector, and this vector can be used as the index to another vector. I hope that's clear. Um, the same thing goes for a matrix. So a matrix can be indexed in more or less the same way. 
Um, so here we have four selections from a matrix um, and I've colored what will be selected. Um, so I can do M123 of 1. So this means give me the first three rows of the first column, which is this little piece here. Um, I can also say give me from the fifth row the third to the sixth column, which will select these values here. Um, I can select singular values as well, so using M. 8,7. So of course M here is the is the name or the variable name of the matrix. So 8,7 is this element here, so the eighth row seven column. And if I want to get a whole column, I can just say M square bracket open, do a space or don't because the space is not needed, but you say comma nine, and this will give you the entire ninth vector of the matrix. And of course you can get the whole first row by just doing M square bracket open one comma nothing square bracket close then you will get the whole first row of the matrix all right and of course here you can use the same structure so you can also use the c function to for example select three to six comma eight and then it will take the eighth number out as well all right so again types of data we have logicals true and false we have numerical values which are 5 7.9 and 10 uh, 100.6 uh, we have character values we have vectors and we have matrices and to make it a little bit more versatile right because a vector and a matrix can only contain a single type like either numeric character or logical uh, of course sometimes you want to have a matrix which in which different columns have different elements or you want to create a a vector in which each element of the vector is of a different type. So R provides you two other data structures called the data frame um, and it contains the list. So a data frame you can is a matrix um, which can contain multiple basic types and it can only contain multiple basic types in each of the columns. So each column can be a different type. So imagine that I have V1 being 1, 2, 3, and 4, which is in, so V1 is a numeric vector, V2 is a character vector, and V3 is a logical vector. Then I can say D is a data frame where I take V1, V2, and V3, and what it now will do it is will, it will create a matrix, a more or less a data frame, right, because it's its own type. The first column will be numeric and contain V1, the second column will be character and will contain v2 and the third column will contain uh, a, a logical data type uh, which is v3 lists are even more um, more of a difficult thing to grasp because if you make a list you can put anything in every element of the list um, so you can even put a matrix in a list, you can put a list in a list. Um, so this allows you to do like multi-dimensional like lists and all of these things. But lists are very versatile. Um, lists allow you to give things names uh, in one go. So I can make a list for example which as the first element has something called name equals Fred. Then the second element is actually numbers equals v1, right? So I, I just put into this second element of the list a vector which contains four elements. And then I, at the third point in the list, I create something which is age, and this has the value 5.3. So here you can see the versatility. I can put the whole list or the whole vector here into the list. I could even put the whole data frame in. So I could say numbers equals D, or I could say data frame equals D, and it will just at the second position put the whole, meta, uh, whole data frame into this list. All right, there's another type in R, um, which is called the factor type, and this is for doing statistics. Um, in statistics, you have things which are categorically uh, categorical variables, and those in R are represented by a factor. So a factor is created by using the keyword factor um, and then I make a combination. So I first repeat the word male 20 times um, and then I combine this with a repeat of the word female 30 times and then this makes a vector, a character vector containing um, male 20 times and then female 30 times and then I say make it a factor and what factor will do it is underwater it will now treat this as a categorical variable of two levels right so things that you want to add to gender have to be male or have to be female you can't put any other value in there 
because then it will throw an error and will say, well, you're not allowed. So it's it's kind of a factor allows you to create kind of your own, uh, create a type which has a very specific amount of, of possibilities. Um, in other languages um, like Java or C++, this is called an enumeration, so an enum. Um, but in R it's called a factor because of um, of, of statistics. In statistics we often deal with different factors and different factor levels. Um, so a factor is treated very differently from a numerical value when we start doing things like linear modeling. And of course there are comments. So comments uh, start with a hashtag. Um, R will ignore these and you should use them often. So if you write a script, use comments, um, I would say for a beginning programmer and even for more advanced programmers you want to have at least one comment per three to five lines of code. So every three to five lines of code that you write, you write a comment um, well after it or above it explaining what the code below does so that other people know what is happening. Um, I also often use comments during the assignments uh, when I want to have um, uh, an answer, right? So I have the code and then the answer, I prepend a hashtag to the answer and then I can write, for example, my observation or I can write the answer from, from the code. All right, so those are more advanced types. All right, my favorite part, what is the type of? And now this is your, your time to shine. Um, so the first one, what is this, what is the type? Is it a logical, a numeric, a character, a data frame, a list? Um, if I just type this in R, what would it be? And I'm counting on you guys to all participate and uh, go. Who wants to go first? No one. Everyone just woke up at their keyboard like, oh my God, what's happening? We have to type something. We have to. All right. Alexander Biliev says logical. Jan Hage says logical. Any more answers? I'm still waiting for the correct answer, though. This is, this is just to trick you guys, right? So this first, uh, first thing here, this true, is a character. It is surrounded by these air quotes, right? And everything between an air quote is a character. So because you use the, 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 the like double quote true to define a character. All right, Sandra just comes up with character. Yes, yes, it is a character because it's surrounded by the quotes, right? So it's it like coding requires eye for detail. So a single quote somewhere can completely change the meaning of your code. All right, so very good. Like at least three people participated. Uh, would be nice to have some more participation, but I'll take it. So the second one. I'll wait. I Is it a character, a logical, a numeric? Don't be shy, like, same story. Yes, same story, indeed. Yeah, character. Very good, very good, character. Yeah, it is indeed a character. Yeah, because it's surrounded by the, by the double quotes. All right, so <clears throat> what is the third one? One E plus eleven. What is this? What is the type of this? Numerical. Yeah. It's it's a numeric value. Num. Numerical. It's numeric, not with the AL. 
I can be a stickler for these things on the uh, on the assignments. So, or not so much the assignments, but also on the exam. Like in R, it, th there's no type called numerical. It's called numeric. <laughs> so, uh, like, it's not wrong. It's just it's not correct. And um, just an other tip, um, I often ask for lists. So, for example, if I would ask, name four things. If you would name five or three, then the answer is wrong. Because like you should read the question. If the question asks for three reasons to do something and you write down four reasons, then I'm not going to choose for you. It's just wrong. You didn't understand the question. Um, so, and I can be a stickler for these kinds of things. I generally am very generous. Um, so I try to kind of read like the answer that people give in the best intention. Um, but if I'm asking for three reasons and people write down four, then it's definitely wrong. It's just something that, um, yeah. <laughs> All right, so the next one, number four on the list. What is the type or of this? Zero X 89. Come on, people, you can do this. Good to know. <laughs> yeah, Jan, it's good to know. Like, um, I'm, I'm generally very generous. So if you, if you, if you make a little rounding error or, or like you, you, these kinds of things. Uh, Na, Na. That's, that's an interesting. Why do you think it's Na, Jan? Alexander says numeric. Any other guesses for what it is? It is indeed a numerical value. So, num yeah, it's numerical. Um, and that is because it's written down in hexadecimals. So 0x89 is actually um, not the number 89. Um, I have to actually type it into R to figure out what it is, um, but 0x89 is actually 137. Is x a variable or a multiplication? No, it's not. It's just the way that you write down hexadecimal numbers. Um, so you would go, um, so something like um, this, so 0x0f, this is actually the number 15 in computer language. So you, you go from, um, so numer or so um, hexadecimals um, go, if you count in hexadecimals, you count like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And then you start with 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E, 1F, 20. Numerical or hexadecimal values. Um, you use them when you're calculating things like bits and megabytes and these kinds of things. It's how these people that sell you a one terabyte hard drive always screw you over and don't give you a terabyte. Right? They give you one billion bytes which is not a terabyte because actually a, a megabyte is actually 1024 times 1024 officially so um, but it's a hexadecimal number so it is still a number so 0x89 is actually 137 um, so it is a numerical value it's just a numerical value all right let's do the let's do the next one um, what do we think is the next one And this again is a is a tricky one, um, but I'm hoping that uh, you guys will get it correct. All right, we get two different answers. So we get a comment and then a vector or a character. It it is a comment. Everything starting with a hashtag afterwards is a comment. Um, if people come from a background where um, the normal thing that people say to this is when they when they have a little bit of HTML or CSS experience, they will say this is a color. 
and it is in theory a color um, but not if you write it like this um, so R and this is an RGB color so this would mean full red no blue and middle green uh, or slightly above middle green um, but because of the hashtag it's a comment in R so R doesn't recognize numbers this way um, you can specify colors in R using the standard kind of hexadecimal coding of, of colors um, but you have to do it differently I'm not going to tell you how but you can look it up all right then let's do this one the one to last as factor true what is the type it's bright pink yeah I know it's bright pink I, I chose it because it's bright pink <laughs> All right, come on, people. Like, what is it? As factor true. No one. No one. Come on, you know this. You know this. You skipped the false. Yeah, I skipped the false. I know I skipped the false. Like that's a logical value, right? Like it's, it's this one and then it's just not quoted. So it's just logical. Um, I know I skipped the false. Like I, I, like by now people should be kind of like there's like I'm trying to, to trick people, right? This is this is this is my favorite question to ask on the R exam generally we have like the whole R exam is just nothing else than guessing the type of different um, different different structures and then I make them uh, make them as as difficult as, as possible Jan Hagen says categorical value yes it is so this one here as factor true so you take a logical factor so you take a, a logical value right and then you force it to be a factor so it is it becomes then a, a factor value because that's what you ask it to, right? So it could be that the, 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 the value of it is NA because it cannot transform it into a factor, but still the thing, the class of the thing that comes out is a factor. All right, so is character 1E plus 11? All right, come on, people. This one, this one's really tricky, right? Normally in the R course, like when I do the R exam, I try to make them like, almost a page long right so it's like going from left to right and then people have to kind of figure out oh my god what's happening here and how are all the conversions going and uh, and it's it's just nice right it, you can't truly understand how complex and insane the type system is from R until you've turned a 5 into a 3 uh, and that you can actually do that like by programming in R you can turn a 5 into a 3 and you already have all the tools to do that so one more, then we can then we can continue. I can then show. Uh, okay, my moderator says logical with a question mark. Are there any other guesses? Like, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Come on. I won't blame you for it. There's no points. There's no like. I might revoke your your VIP status if you have it wrong, but that's about it. That's that's the maximum that I can do. Like you're in your safe home environment. Um, like. I can't hit you with a stick, which I would normally do when we do live lectures. Um, so, all right, we get a character and a numerical, and then another character. All right, all of a sudden, like people are really interested. All right, so this is a logical value, and why is it a logical value? Well, it is a numeric value, right? And then I'm asking, is this a character? To which the answer is false it is not a character so the thing is it this whole statement is nothing more than just false and the class of false is logical so it is it is is just a question so it will it will give me a boolean answer yes or no and a boolean is a is a uh, logical value all right i hope you guys like this um should we do a quick intermezzo? I think we do a quick intermezzo. I want to I want to show you something in R. All right, so in R, right, we can do lists. I told you guys that we can do lists in R. So I can do C, and then I can do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And this is all numeric. 
So now let's do something else and let's start turning, for example, a five into a three. So I make a little list um, and I call this V1 and I put the numbers three, four, five in here like this, right? So when I type V1, I get three, four, five. <laughs> Jan Hage, yeah, yeah, it is, it is. It is really, the type system in R will, it will screw you over. I've been programming in R for like 12 years and it's still like on a daily basis, like surprises me. Um, so now we have something which contains three, four, five, right? So how are we going to trick the R type system into making this into one, two, three? Well, the, the, the answer is here, use the root to make it factorial, right? Be factorials, it tries to encode in the smartest way possible. So if I say um, as factor of uh, V1, right? Then it will now show me three, four, five. So it's still correct. And then it says that there are three levels, three levels called three, four, and five. But now there's a disconnect because underwater R tries to be smart. I told you it saves everything in ROM memory, right? So it tries to be smart and save ROM memory. So how it codes this is actually, it codes this one as one, this one as two, and this one as three. And then it just has like an additional lookup table called levels, which it then couples. The first level is three, the second level is four, and the third level is five. So if I take this as vector and I do then do an as numeric on it, right? Then now all of a sudden R just starts surprising everyone because now it's just one, two, three. So I changed three, four, five into one, two, three just by switching the type system, right? From numeric to factor back to numeric. So the type system in R is not, um, it's not congruent, right? So, so uh, it's not in the inverse of each other. Going from numeric via factor back to numeric is not. So how do you actually make it back into three, four, five? Well, there's, there's, you have to then go to a higher type, right? Because the factor is a type which is between the logical and the numerical values. But you can go via the S character, right? If we go via the S character, then now it will be three, four, five again. So we take a numeric value, make it into a factor, underwater R starts saving memory, coding it as zero, or coding it as one, two, three with a lookup table. Then when we do an S character on it, it tr transforms them back into characters, but now we have to transform them back to numeric. So this is the way that you can just completely get like completely mind boggled by the R system or R type system. All right, master flexi, as factor as numeric as factor V1. Yeah, that, then it will code it as one, two, three with the, the levels one, two, three, right? So it's just an as factor. And then you want to do an as numeric as factor, right? One, two, three, levels one, two, three. It's, it's really, really difficult. And then there's one other thing which is really tricky and that is the strings as factor. Because generally in the older versions of R, this was set to true. So when you would load in a data set and you would have a column, right? And this column would obviously be a character column. If there would be the same character twice, it would directly start transforming it into a factor. And then in the newer version of R, they put this to false. So that means that they broke like 10 years of code, which was actually dealing with this weird transformation on the bottom to now have it being like, well, more or less what people expect, but it's still very difficult. So trust me, like the type system in R, it will, it will definitely screw you over many, 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 many times. Every, like every, three to five days I run into something and it's just, um, so always check. And especially when it says levels, as soon as it starts saying levels, you have to really, really like pay attention. Like, does this, does this really, do I really want this to be a, a categorical variable? Um, but it saves a lot of memory space. And that used to be a big issue in R is, is memory. All right, back to the PowerPoint, um, back to learning new stuff. All right, so this was fun, right? Are we enjoying ourselves? Are you not entertained? <laughs> All right, so a list. Lists are, again, one of these mind-boggling things. Um, so in R, you have the single 
bracket, right? So if you want to index a vector or if you want to index a matrix, then you use the square bracket singular. Um, but if you want to do a list, then you have to use the double bracket. And why that is, there's a good reason why that is, and that is since a list can contain anything. So here I'm making a list called W, right? So it has name Fred, um, then the numbers are one, two, three, four, then I put the age in again, and now I put a whole matrix in the fourth position, right? So I put a matrix which has one, zero, zero, one, number of rows, two, <laughs> number of columns is also two. <laughs> All right, it's good that you're entertained. I, I find this highly entertaining as well. Like I've, I've done this on many conferences and especially the list with things to guess, right? Like I've never been into a crowd, even when I've had crowds which are there for like, I did the list in uh, King's College um, at an advanced R programming course where I was teaching like a one day uh, exercise. And even people who have been working with R for 30 years, they would make errors in these small like statements. And it's it's very, very funny and it, it it's hard. Like, like the only reason why I know the answer is because I typed them in and asked for the class in R. Um, Good. So a list. Lists are even more um, more of a mind mind thing. Um, so a list. I just make a list when I type W, right? So I store it in a variable called W. When I type W, I see here um, my my list, right? So a list can contain anything, literally anything. It it can even contain a reference to itself, which makes it just like a circular list. But in this case, it's a relatively short list. It has four elements. First element is a character vector. Uh, the second element is numbers, uh, so a, a numerical um, vector. The, this one is also a numerical vector, just contains one element. And then here we have the matrix. So if we want to select from a list, we can do it in two ways. We can use uh, the double square bracket and then specify which element we want from the list. And then I still have to specify this. Give me the first element, right? Because otherwise I would get back a vector which contains a, a, a character Fred. But if I want to select Fred as a, as a singular character value, um, then I have to select from W, from the first element of W, which is called, which has the name name, um, I can then select the first. Fortunately, you don't have to always use the double brackets because I gave it names, right? So I, I, I gave each each element of the list a name. I can also use W, um, dollar, numbers, and then from that I want to select the, th the second and the third element. So then it selects this two and three from numbers. Um, and of course this is not the two, these are the indexes and these are the numbers that I get back, right? If this would be one, 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 then this would give me back two ones instead of two and three. I can also say something like from W, give me the fourth element of the list and then give me from the thing that you get back the first column. So it will give me the first column of the fourth element in W. And of course I can do the same thing by using the dollar sign. So I can say W dollar matrix. So from the, the thing called matrix, give me one comma. So these, these things look really neat, right? So why would you ever want to use the double square bracket thingy? And why would you not always give it names? Well, sometimes you have duplicate names and a list can actually have duplicate names for some inexplicable reason they allow to have duplicate names in a list um, and that happens especially when you're combining multiple lists um, so in this case um, it then you can only use the brackets to select the thing that you want because if you do W matrix and there's two elements called matrix you will get just the first one back and not the second one if you want to get the second one then you have to explicitly give the ordering at which it is in the list all right, so some, some additional functions for matrices and data frame. You can ask for, for example, the number of rows of a matrix, the number of columns of a matrix. Um, row names and call names are interesting because they are functions which give you back the row names or the column names, but you can also assign to them. So I can say if I have a matrix which has three rows and three columns, I can actually put the names on there like this. So it, it allows, it's a getter and it's a setter function. So I can actually assign new row names to the matrix. 
I can also transpose the matrix, so the, I can use the T function um, to transpose a matrix, which means that everything which used to be in columns is now in the rows, um, and everything which was in the rows is now in the columns. So it, it just takes the matrix and, and flips it on its side. So I have made a, or I've, I haven't made, I, I found this really nice image uh, about a matrix and its transpose. So you can see here that column number one in the transpose is row number one. And this you use a lot in computer programming. I don't know why, but matrices always are the wrong way around. For example, the box plot function it plots the columns, right? So if you would have um, if you would have the matrix row wise, right? If you would do the log two on one, so using the apply to the matrix comma one comma something, then you have to transpose it before making the box plot. Otherwise, you would have like a gazillion box plots next to each other, and it would take half an hour to plot that. Um, and you can actually not really interrupt the plotting routine in R, which is a little bit of a shame. So if you make a mistake in a plotting routine and you say plot the 60 million elements, uh, then it will just do that and you will just have to wait or kill the entire R session. Um, so transposing your matrix, making rows into columns and columns into rows. All right, we've already seen variables, but I want to tell you a little bit more about variables. So variables are, in my mind, boxes. So a variable is a box and you can put stuff in a box and in R you can do that in two ways. You can use this arrow or you can use the is. So the is is there and it's just the assignment. Um, I generally tend to prefer the arrow when I first define a variable. When I then update the variable I tend to prefer the is. So um, in R um, if I would write a little piece of code, let's go back to the R window actually. So when I would define a new variable, I would say um, new var um, is, um, for example, a. And now when I when I'm in my script and I'm updating it, then I would say new var is, and then I would assign a new value to it. And this is of course this this doesn't have to be. Um, but the arrows allow you to also do something else, which is more useful. So if I'm, for example, having a vector, right, and I'm defining my vector, and um, at this point, I don't want to go all the way to the front and then do the arrow and assign it to somewhere. I can also use the arrow the other way around and, ins and put it into new var2, right? So I can also assign the other way. And when you're typing code, this sometimes comes in handy. So the arrow allows you to go like both ways, um, while the is only assigns to, to the left side. Good. So arrows, useful. Um, and again, there's two. Um, there's actually more arrows that you can use. But um, anyway, so variables in my mind are boxes. And um, you can put stuff in, and you don't know. Hey, you can use the box, and you have without knowing what is in it. So you can just put something in and I don't care if it's a list or a, or a, or a data frame. I can in the end inspect the box and see if it is a list or a matrix or a data frame. Um, but uh, Alright, so words in the middle. Um, I put this in to know when we are at, at around half of the presentation, so I don't think we will finish the whole presentation today, but um, clean code is clean scripts. Um, always try to work as clean as possible. Um, a lot of you come from like a laboratory setting and also there you want to work as clean as possible. Um, so I have, for example, when I do my assignments for the lectures um, and I'm hoping when you do the assignments that you use a new file for a new lecture. Um, name files in a logical way. So call them assignments1.r, assignments2.r or even better would be answers lecture one or answers assignment two or something like that right but it's up to you to create structure um, i always try to add a header in the comment section for each file like i showed you right um, so for example if i look at my um, if i look at my uh, answer then i always have something like this on top just to know these are the answers to the assignments of lecture four and it's written by me um, I would advise you to always do this um, and when you do this um, also put your name there right so make the name the date so today is the 3rd of December 2020 
state the purpose of the file and add a copyright statement. And this will save your ass sometimes. I've had people stealing my code, pretending it was theirs, and they can change the header. Um, but it com uh, if you take a header and you combine it with version control, something like um, Git or um, other version control, which kind of um, cryptographically signs your your changes and then puts them on a on a repository online, this can really help in case you other people steal your code or someone sues you for copyright infringement of stuff that they think they invented but you actually did. Um, so very very big tip is if you make a new file and you put code in that file always add a header, the name, the date, the purpose of the file, the copyright statement, how do I want other people to use my code. Even if you don't want other people to use your code just say that it's copyrighted by me um, and it's it's my private intelligence. Where can you put it online? So I always use GitHub, um, which is nowadays owned by Microsoft. Um, so, but then you have to use Git. So you have to use a version control system which digitally signs your commits. So every time that you make a change to the file, you make a commit and then I put it online for everyone to see. Um, so if you wanna look at the code um, that, that I made, uh, let me get my... Uh, so here you can find more or less all of my code um, uh, where um, where I'm working on. Um, so I always use GitHub. There's many of these. You have also have GitLab and you have uh, Mercurial, you have S, uh, SVN. And there's a lot of different version control systems. So find one which works for you. Um, I always use GitHub um, just because I've, I've been used to it and I've been using it for seven years. And I actually still pay for it. It actually it went from being a paid system to when Microsoft bought it to a free system, uh, but I still pay seven seven euros a month for it, just because I like supporting Microsoft, and uh, you should support Microsoft any way you can, like with Apple and like the other kind of big companies like Google and stuff, like screwing them over all the time. Um, I like Windows as well, so just just pay for it. But, uh, so the things that you can find here are, for example, the web server I wrote. Um, CTL mapping, G Network 2, so all of the projects that I that I worked on or co contributed to, and um, I just put it online. And in the case that someone steals your code, um, then you have proof, right? I can sh I can show, for example, that when I started writing my web server, um, the first commit I made was in. 2013 um, at a certain date and it's cryptographically signed by my private key so people know that it's that it's mine um, but put the header there um, so that everyone knows if they can or cannot use your code um, and of course I'm a big fan of open source software so always put stuff under LGPL3 or something um, yeah an alternative to github is bitbucket you also have GitLab, which people are very lyrical about um, so you don't have to make a GitHub account, and, but um, you, can, you can use anything that you want. All right, um, as an example, um, this is for example something that I wrote. Um, so it's the analysis of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So this is the, the purpose of the file. Um, I, it is copyrighted by 2015 by the HU Berlin, since I work for the HU Berlin. Um, they automatically kind of own the copyright that I write during work time. Um, it was written by me. It was last modified in April of 2015 and it was first written in February 2015. And like I said, all my scripts start with a set working directory. So it, it just moves to a file on the hard drive, on my hard drive, so I know exactly where uh, to, to sub. Yeah, so also works with Git or Mercurial. Yeah. There's a lot of lot of um, version control systems out there. Um, some of them are difficult to use. Some of them are easier to use. But um, I, I like Git. It takes it takes like half a year to really get into it and understand it um, um, and to use it on a day to day basis. But you sh you should. All right. So clean code. Um, we will go back. Uh, one of the things that I always advise people is also to use a good text editor. Um, so on Windows, I always advise people to use Notepad++. Um, the window that you're seeing here when I'm, when I'm showing you code is Notepad++. Um, one of the nice things about this, oh, um, I 
pressed a button which I shouldn't have pressed. Um, but what I like is that, um, for example, when I open, let's open some code which is relatively nice. Um, so most of the code that you actually are looking at is um, code highlighted. So it didn't code highlight the answers here because I saved it as a text file. Um, but if you open up a file, then it has like this whole list of languages that I actually, um, that it actually understands. Um, so here you can see that it highlights things like comments in, in green, um, numbers are in orange, so you can directly see that it's a number. Um, strings here are highlighted in, um, in gray. Um, and for example, some keywords are highlighted in, in blue so that you know, oh, you're creating a new object uh, and head like the while and the if statements, they are, they are highlighted. So they have a slightly different color uh, from the rest, um, which is good. So, hey, you can physically look at the code. And this, of course, clean code is nice code. You can see that there's no copyright statement here. And this is because I'm still working on the code and it's still private. This is, this is my private code and I put it on GitHub so it's all tracked and, um, and there's a copyright statement I think in the main repository. Um, so I didn't put one on top of every file because this project is like 500 files big. Um, so um, it's, I don't always follow my own advice, um, which I should more often actually. Um, so, but yeah, yeah, so use code, code that looks good is easy to maintain. So if you get back to code and you have everything nice, like, hey, when you do a while, you do a space and then you do the stuff in between and then you do your bracket. And hey, one of the things that uh, Notepad++ also has, it has bracket highlighting. So when I click on a bracket, I can automatically see where the bracket is closed. So it's opened here and it's closed here. And for example, this one here is opened here and it's closed here. The same thing it would do for these ones. Um, so hey, it, it just allows me to visually look at the code and work with it. Um, so back to the PowerPoint, don't show you any secret code that I'm writing. Um, but uh, when you use Windows, um, use Notepad++. It's, it's without a doubt in all the, the dozens of years. But if you put it on GitHub, people can access it, right? So what if they steal the idea, not the code? Uh, that's fine, right? Ideas are not... I have an idea every time that I go to the toilet and that's not copyright protected or anything. Only code is. Implementation of ideas are protected. Um, ideas themselves are not protected at all. And ideas are just nothing. They don't exist. Just in your mind. Um, and GitHub actually allows you private repositories. So some of my repositories on GitHub are private. So you can't look into it. Only I can. Only when you have the proper authorization. I can still add people to these private repositories. So I can work together with other people on code, um, but no one outside of our little group can see it. Um, and of course they can steal the idea. Like you, like Facebook is a very simple idea, right? You could steal the idea of Facebook, but try and getting it being as popular as the real Facebook is going to be an issue. Like that's going to be hard. Um, on OS X, Text Wrangler, actually I think this is outdated because Text Wrangler doesn't exist anymore. Uh, let me see what uh, the current name of it is. Text Wrangler is now called BB Edit. So uh, on OS X use BB Edit, not Text Wrangler. Text Wrangler is old. Um, Linux, if you're if you're working and coding on Linux, if you're smart enough to install Linux, then you can use whatever the hell you want. You're good enough to using computers to figure out what is a good text editor. So uh, most importantly, if you if, if you want to use a good text editor, make sure that it has code highlighting, like I showed you, that it highlights like strings different from numbers, from from keywords, um, and that it supports bracket testing. Bracket testing is going to save your noodle or whatever you want to call it. Because hey, you can easily see where stuff starts and ends, um, and some will also warn you when something is missing. Although I do not like text editors which force me to, uh, which hey, when you click an open bracket, it automatically introduces a closing bracket. Something like Atom or Visual Studio Code does that. I hate that. Uh, I, I, I don't like text editors to put additional brackets, so closing brackets for me. I don't like that, but I want them to highlight it so I can see where it ends. 
All right, so like I said, clean code is smart code. Um, so um, here, for example, you see the exact same code twice, um, but this is just a confusing mess, right? You can't see what is what, and here you have a nice unordered list with list items, and then in the last list item you have like a sub... Yep. Identation is everything. Um, code follows a structure, and, and align it in that structure. Don't type anything, everything on one, one line. You can... Um, also in R, you can just use dot comma and then type the next statement, do dot comma, type the next statement. So you can put everything on one line, making the line like a million characters long. Um, but that's not going to help you. Um, so, so make code clean, make it, make it structured. All right, then we're going to take a short break. And then when I come back, we will talk about control structures, which in my mind, have, since variables are boxes, control structures are conveyor belts, bringing, um, bringing a, a box from place A to place B. Um, so they guide boxes to their correct destination based on a fixed algorithm. So we will talk about that after the um, break. So I will, um, I will start the... Um, second break, so let me stop.